。哇，笑啦！我一上去，哎，我一帮阿叔哥做 recce just now， 努力做，顺便做 extra。那啦 ，reserve is only why so 笑 on。还是 look at Joe， his face been tear tear， 来我唔带佢哋。哎，老兵哎，别打人家家。啊，等下，那打野啦，啊 ，reserve is doing train hard 啦。This is for everyone's sake, okay? So we can get best performance. What best performance? You crazy or not? 笑啊 ！You see other section already go for canteen break, drink, finish their coffee, and we just return 了呢。呀啦，哎 ，You see the other section? Ha, the sergeant treat the men so good. Ha, you want to score points? Then don't sabo us lah. Ha, like last week. Don't need to do water parade. Also make us drink until vomit. Then now don't need recce. Also need do extra. How much class sergeant are used, yeah? I'm the sergeant or you're the sergeant. When the enemy come, you think they'll differentiate between active unit and non-active unit. Let us reserve this unit, huh? What kind of soldier are you? Weeks, yeah? Hello. Why are you so hockey? Ah, Christian must control anger, yeah. Hey guys, guys, guys. Forget it. It's okay. It's over already. No point arguing. No point blaming each other as well, sergeant. Calm down, lah. You know, I think God wants us to practice self-control. Shut up, lah, Joe. Huh? I'm angry. So what? The Bible never said I cannot be angry, right? And even if I'm angry, God will forgive me, right? Why you so hockey? Ah, Christian must control anger. Hey, guys, guys, guys. Sergeant, calm down, lah. You know, I think God wants us to practice self-control. Alright, today in our message, uh, we're going to explore uh, some of these things. And uh, before we go into our message, let's pray uh, and commit this time to the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I want to give thanks for the privilege and honour that weekly we can gather into your presence in the house of God uh, to worship you, Lord. Father, we give thanks that your presence is here. Uh, may you speak to us deeply uh, through your word, what the gospel means and how to walk by the Spirit in our daily lives. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. We are on Sermon 5 in the uh, Extraordinary Gospel Sermon Series. And today we're going to look at this topic called Set Free by the Spirit. All right, uh, and uh, before we go into uh, the, the sermon, I want to do a questionnaire, a survey, all right? Uh, next slide, please. The question I'm going to ask you before I go into my sermon is this question. Who do you want to become? Okay, who do you want to become? There are only two choices, multiple choice. You have to choose one out of these two. The first choice you can choose is, I want to be a good person. Good person means a morally upright. Somebody integrity, somebody who is uh, righteous. Okay, a morally good person. Uh, second choice, I want to be a free person. Okay, I want to be free uh, to, to do what I want, do what I like, all right? So you have a choice, either A or B, all right? Who wants to be A? Raise your hands. A, 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 about 20%. Who wants to be B? About 60%. The rest, you are not sure. Or you want both? Or you want both, ah? Who want both? Wow, everybody, lah. Hey. The Kiasu Singaporean syndrome coming up. All right. Uh, uh, from this, uh, from this question, actually, um, sociologists who study on social trend, uh, they say that 30, 40 years ago in the modern era, most people would raise their hands at number one. Hey, I want to be a good person, uh, because 30, 40 years ago in the modern era, uh, everybody know what is right and wrong. They know the Bible. They know what God requires. Uh, they know there's a set of uh, rules and principles that everybody is to follow and everybody desire to be that man of integrity, uh, that person that follow after God's moral law. Uh, but, but in recent years, uh, in what we call the postmodern era where our young adults and our youth uh, belong to, they say there is a movement. People no longer want to be morally good persons. They want to be free persons. Okay, they want to be free persons. What do I mean by free person? It means they are free to do whatever they want. Nobody should tell me what to do uh, and tell me what not to do. Okay, so we are influenced by uh, Western culture. Uh, in America, what are they called? 
they are called the what? The land of the free, okay? So we all want to be free. Uh, they talk about individualism, individual rights, uh, to, to, to do what they want and to be taken care and, and the human dignity uh, must be there. So the, the, we are influenced uh, by this concept that we want to be free. So if you look in our world today, um, economically, maybe we are, we are more free than last time. Uh, politically, Maybe some of us think we are more free, uh, not, not more free. Okay, it's up to you. Uh, and um, maybe in America, they say, oh, we are a democratic country. Everybody gets to vote. Everybody has uh, the rights to be protected and all that. Uh, but you have to ask, is it true that we are getting more free? Is it really true? Economically, politically, yes. But how about morally and spiritually? Are we really getting more free? Are we getting more free? As we desire to be free, the irony is that morally and spiritually, we are more than ever before in the bondage and slavery of sin than ever before. Next slide. Uh, today, in this world, as we desire to be free, to do whatever we want, we realize uh, that we are enslaved by many different things. Uh, there's this boy, Fire O, um, his parents used to use the device so that when he eat, he would not make so much noise, okay, to pacify him. Uh, and he was so addicted to the handphone uh, that at the age of five, his parents said, okay, enough, give me the handphone. Okay, it's enough, you have been watching it. And he was so angry that he took the handphone and smashed it on the floor. Okay, that's where the parents realized, oh no, my child has become an addict. My child is in trouble and we need help. So today, we are in a different kind of slavery. We are in a slavery of social media. We are in a slavery of internet. Uh, we are in a slavery of media. We are in a slavery of pornography. We are in a slavery, our young people is in a slavery of a hookup culture. Uh, we are in a slavery of, of drugs. And those who are working, we are in a slavery of a workaholic culture. Singapore ranked highest in terms of the average number of works, uh, a number of hours of work, higher than even Japan and South Korea, which is uh, surprising uh, to me. So we are, we, in our pursuit of freedom, we realize that we have fallen into a different kind of slavery. Whether we know it or not, we think we are free, but actually we are less free. Timothy Keller says this, in many areas of our life, freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones. The liberating restrictions, those that fit with the reality of our nature and the world, produces greater power and scope for abilities and a deeper joy and fulfillment. So the issue, uh, the mistaken uh, issue in our modern society is we think that Freedom is doing whatever we want. But that is not true. If you examine it closer, would Singapore be a more free country if there were no laws? Everybody can do whatever they want. Would Singapore be a more free country if there were no traffic lights? No. There will be more accidents than ever before. There will be more crime than ever before. Would the World Cup be more free and more enjoyable if there were no referees and VAR? No, as VR, video assisted referee. Will it be more free? No, there'll be more fights on the pitch because nobody knows whether it's a goal or not a goal, whether it's an offside or not offside. Okay, so we'll not be more free. So some of us say, well, Christianity adopts a restriction. Ten commandments, very restrictive. So my challenge to you is go to a country, a, a place where there is no uh, a policeman, there's no law. You go and break all the Ten Commandments and then one year later, you come back and tell me, whether you're a better person. You can lie, you can steal, you can rape, you can kill. No problem. One year later, you tell me whether you're more free. So freedom is, is not without restriction. Freedom is living within the liberating restriction that help us uh, to, to know why we are here on earth. It helps us to live out who we are, who we are created to be uh, in Christ Jesus. All right, so... Uh, in the past few sermons, we have tried to explain what is the gospel. Everybody knows already. We've tried to explain the purpose of the law. What is the law for? Today, for the first time, 
the Apostle Paul brings in the third element, the Holy Spirit. So uh, Apostle Paul brings the Holy Spirit and he wants to know what is the relationship between the gospel, the law, and the Holy Spirit. So the big idea for us today is we want to learn from this passage how to live uh, the victorious Christian life of freedom through the audit of the law, through the truth of the gospel, and the power of the Spirit. So this relationship uh, uh, sometimes can be uh, mistaken because we think, oh, our law is evil. No, we are not living under law. We should discard the law. Uh, but in this chapter, chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, we're going to explore how the law was absolutely necessary. That the law was given in the Old Testament uh, to establish how God is holy. What God likes and what God doesn't like. And because He is holy, we realize, the children of Israel realize they cannot meet the standard of the law. And they fall to their face because they fail time and time again. So that when the gospel of grace came through Jesus Christ, they knew and they appreciated the grace of God because they know they couldn't make it, but through Christ, they receive the gospel. And because they receive the gospel, it is not enough. Uh, Jesus Christ didn't just die and then just left. Jesus Christ Die and he said, as I leave, I'm going to give you a helper that will help you to live the Christian life. So it's not enough just to gaze upon the gospel and give thanks for the gospel. There is a helper, a third person of the Trinity that was given to us to live the Christian life. Okay, so from this passage, we see, uh, we, we, we see the progression of, of, of how the law leads to the gospel and the gospel leads to the Holy Spirit. So from Galatians chapter 5, uh, the first thing we can see from this passage is that we have been set free under grace through faith and not under the law. So we are saved by the gospel and not by legalism. In uh, chapter 5 verse 1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. This is telling us that uh, the freedom that the world gives, the freedom that the world promises, at the end of the day always causes bondage, it causes addiction, uh, and, and it doesn't give us the freedom that we are looking for. But the freedom that Christ gives is the true freedom that will really set us free to live as how we are created, to live the purpose for which we are created. Uh, and, and, and Paul begins to tell them, uh, you are set free by the gospel, but be careful, be careful because even though you are set free by the gospel, many of us will try to earn our salvation through legalism. Okay, in, in verse 2, it says, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who let himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. So Paul is saying some of you will try to be circumcised according to Jewish law. Some of you will try to obey the whole law to earn your own salvation. He's telling you, hey, don't do that. You are, you are uh, making the, 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 the sacrifice of Christ of no value. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor non-circumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself true love. So the first thing that Paul wants to establish again and again in the book of Galatians is don't try to earn your own salvation. If you do something uh, uh, for God when you're trying to save yourself, you're actually being selfish. You're trying to save yourself. You're not doing it for God. You're actually trying to do it for yourself. And that is not how I want you to serve me. I want you to serve me not to be saved. I want you to serve me because you are safe. So Paul again uh, warns them and uh, reminds them why and the basis for which uh, they are safe. So this morning, uh, I, have, I have a brother in Christ who will help us with this sermon illustration to help us to remember 
uh, what it means by the gospel, the law, and Holy Spirit. And it's none other than uh, Brother Simon. Let's welcome him on stage. Hallelujah. <laughs> Brother Simon represents uh, um, someone who is a sinner. Okay, Brother Simon uh, with his black shirt represents somebody who is sinful. He realizes he's sinful. Through the law, he realizes he cannot match up. Uh, and he knows that he needs God. Okay, you need God. How you need God? He knows that he needs God. Okay, so he cry out to God. God, save me. Save me. I cannot save myself because uh, I'm, a, I'm a great sinner and your law is, 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 is too big for me to obey. And God comes to Simon and then uh, God says, hey, you are forgiven. I'm going, to, I'm going to forgive you of your sin and I'm going to clothe you with righteousness. He closed Simon with righteousness and asked Simon to get up. So Simon becomes a Christian. But because Simon doesn't understand the gospel, he thinks that being a Christian has to, has to do with doing a lot of right things and good things. Nothing wrong with that. But that's how he viewed his Christian life, by his performance. So someday Simon has been a good Christian. He's been doing his quiet time. He's having a good relationship uh, with his family. He stays away. Uh, from sin, he's serving God. And because he's doing so well uh, as a believer, he begins to look down on his other cellmates who are not doing so well. How do you look down? He's looking down on you, huh? Because he's on higher ground. Okay? So he feels good about himself, okay, when he's doing well. But on some other weeks, when he's not doing so well, his, his spiritual life is dry, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's has a quarrel with his family, his, his wife, and, and uh, his life is, is, is in some form of a sin, and he feels condemned. Okay, it's at this point that he hides away from God and from people. Okay, he hides away. So if your cell member has been absent for a while, please call them, okay? He hides away, you know, and he's not doing so well. Okay, and uh, his life is a uh, Christian life is a roller coaster. Some days good, some days no good. Uh, so because it's based a lot on his performance. Okay, and this is what we call legalism. Okay, legalism. Okay, legalism. Legalism is what it is: faith plus good works plus obedience plus sacraments. Sacraments are things like baptism, holy communion. Uh, tradition, some people believe in tradition, some be people believe, oh, they have to come to church uh, in order to be safe. Okay, so that is legalism. And legal the picture of legalism is somebody who is trying to do the Kung Fu Panda style. The Kung Fu Panda. Not like that. Lah. Okay, the Kung Fu Panda style, okay. I'm going to preach for 30 minutes. Uh, let's, let's see how long uh, Brother Simon can hold in that position. Okay? Okay? Go for Panda, okay? So he's in this position, not very stable. Okay? Quite tired. Okay? Quite tired. Uh, and, 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 the, and the Word of God says this, if a person can save himself by obedience and good works, it says here that Christ will be of no value to you, to you at all. Anyway, you can save yourself, okay? Don't need Christ. Okay, you. Well done. Okay? So this is... Hey, don't get up. Ah. Half an hour, friend. You only two minutes only. You cannot already. Okay? So that's how he lived the Christian life. Because he doesn't understand the gospel. So the gospel is like this chair. Okay? It represents Calvary. The finished work of Jesus on the cross. Okay? Finished work. Past, present, and future sins has been forgiven by Christ. What Christ has done on the cross. You cannot earn it. You cannot save yourself. So now, I give Simon the chair. Wow. How do you feel? Good. Good, right? Ah. So I give him the chair and the chair represents the finished work of Jesus Christ. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Simon, are you using any strength to prop yourself up in this chair? No. Okay, Simon, I want to ask you, do you trust that this chair do you trust this chair completely that it will not break under your weight? Yes, I trust. Are you sure? I saw off one of the legs. Okay, so Simon here 
is trusting in the chair completely. He's trusting in Jesus and the finished work of Jesus on the cross to save him. Okay, he's trusting Christ to do that. Okay, and, and from this uh, uh, position, uh, there is this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where it says, God made Christ who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This means because Simon, Simon is in Christ, the righteousness of God, of Christ now wraps around him. Okay? Uh, it's imputed to Simon not because of anything he has done. It is by the grace of God. Because Simon is wrapped, when God sees Simon, he doesn't see the black part. He only sees the white part because Simon is in Christ and he's wearing the robes of righteousness that Christ gave to him. Because he's in Christ, this robe is not just any white cloth. This robe is not just the robes of righteousness. These are royal robes of sonship, a royal robes that belong to the royal family of God. And this is not just some red chair from level two. This represents the throne of God, where in the days to come, Simon will rule and reign with Christ in the coming age. The inheritance of God will be given to Simon. So Simon, from a beggar to a royal prince, how do you feel? Feel free. Wow. So Simon understand uh, the, the grace that he has received and he feels free and he feels forgiven and he feels a sense of gratitude. So the gospel is this. Okay, the gospel is this. Salvation is in, is in what? Faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. This is the gospel. He cannot earn it. If he can earn it, Jesus Christ don't need to die for him. Okay, that is the gospel. You have to understand this. You have to understand this gospel. But the problem is that Paul begins to highlight, even though this is the gospel, this is a simple gospel, that there are many people who will come into the church to, to what? To alter the gospel, to, to tarnish and, and, and to uh, uh, change what the gospel is. Okay, in verse 7, he says this, okay, he says this, you, okay, you, emphatic, were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth, the truth of the gospel? The kind of persuasion doesn't come from the one who calls you. A little yeast, small or wrong teaching, work itself through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that He will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Okay, very strong words. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You all know what is emasculate? Nah? I have to check nah, because my English is not so good. Yunak nah, or Tai Jian. Nah. Okay? Very strong words there. Eh? You shocked, right? Is this Ari or what? You know, Ari. The, it's very strong words by Paul because Paul is saying in, in, uh, in Galatians chapter 1, if you, if you change the gospel, you will be cursed by God. And then now here in chapter 5, he says, if you change the gospel, why don't you go and cut off yourself from the body of Christ? Get out! Okay, get out! You don't belong here. Kick you out. Because the gospel is something so important that nobody should change it or alter it in any way. If you do that, you will be cursed. Very strong words. So we can have different views about the end times, but we cannot have different views about the gospel. The gospel is the core of Christianity. The gospel needs to be set right. From this passage, we move on to the second error when it comes to the gospel. The first error is legalism where we add things uh, to faith in order to save ourselves. The second error with pertaining to the gospel is found in the next few verses. You are set free to love one another, not sin more. Okay? We are set free by the gospel and not hyper grace. 
In verse 13, it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out that you will be destroyed by each other. So we see here there are two enemies of the gospel, okay? The first enemy I've already talked about is legalism. I obey, therefore I'm accepted, okay? So this is focus on the law, obeying the law. And the other extreme is what we call hypergrace, where we use our freedom to indulge the flesh. In hypergrace, basically people are saying, because I am safe, therefore no need to obey. The law of God doesn't apply to us. We live in the covenant of grace. Okay, even the moral law doesn't apply to us. We live in the covenant of grace. We are led by the Spirit. Whatever I think is right, I will do. Don't use the law to judge me. Don't use the law to judge one another. So it's completely grace. So there's a swing. Hyper grace, because the church has been legalistic. And now because of hyper grace, some are moving to legalism to condemn hyper grace. But that is not the gospel. Legalism or hyper grace is not the gospel. The gospel is this. The gospel according to Paul is this. I am safe, accepted unconditionally. Therefore, out of gratitude, I obey. I am not obeying to get myself safe. I am obeying because I am safe. The progression is important. The progression is where Paul is trying to uh, to tell us. He says here uh, that it is possible for us to use our freedom to indulge the flesh. It is possible for us to abuse the grace of God and for the grace of God to be trampled upon underfoot. You place it at your foot, please. Take out and place it at your foot. Okay, it's a very serious, it's a very serious thing to abuse and take for granted the grace of God. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it says exactly that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice of sins, for sins is left. Okay, we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth. No sacrifice of sins is left. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? You all didn't know this verse in the Bible, right? Really? Uh, don't know, right? Uh, Brother Simon said, where got this verse? Are you sure I can step or not? Lightning will come or not? Uh, but this is lightning protected. But when you step out, I don't know. Lah. Huh? Oh, you step, we're stepping on the grace of God. Very serious. Very scary. So we abuse uh, 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 the, the grace of God uh, in, in, uh, in, in their life. Okay, we abuse the grace of God in their life and do whatever they want. Uh, and, and the issue with hyper grace is it's all about you. God is your divine butler. God is here to make you prosper financially, physically, emotionally, whatever you want, I will give you because you are favoured of God. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is not about you. The gospel is about God, getting God. Not getting God to get what you want, but to get God. And it says here, the gospel needs to translate into loving one another. So you are blessed, not for your own sake. You are blessed so that you can be a Blessing. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. And that's what's wrong with hyper grace. It's about you feeling good. It's about you receiving the benefits of salvation full stop. You better pick up the cloth. If not, something might happen later. So the true gospel will, will make uh, Simon love God more and love others more. All right? So this is the, this is the true gospel. Uh, and uh, out of gratitude, he will obey God. The third thing we can see from this passage, the third thing we can see from this passage is that you are set free by the power of the Spirit 
over the flesh. Okay, so uh, Paul has finished talking about legalism, hyper grace. Now he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit for? He says here, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desire what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul begins to introduce the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not enough just to gaze on the beauty of Christ and the gospel. Uh, Christ himself sent us the Holy Spirit, the helper, the advocate, to teach us about him and to guide us in our Christian life. So in this passage, uh, there are two things that uh, we can see from this passage. The first thing uh, is this phrase, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit is a command. It's an imperative in Greek, which means that Simon has to make the decision, the man's part, to decide to walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. So he has to decide to walk by the Spirit. Okay, God cannot force him. He has to decide on his part. But at the same time, in the, in the last verse, it says, if you are led by the Spirit, it's a passive term, which represents the God part. So as he makes the man's part to walk, it says here, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So it's not just about him making the decision. He has to surrender his life to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So together, he is walking according to the Spirit, right? So walking according to the Spirit is not, um, it's a daily thing. It's a daily affair thing. It's not just a one-time uh, baptized in the Spirit and that's all. It's a daily walking. So walking has to do with a lifestyle, something that you do daily, how we can hear the voice of God and obey it. Uh, just some two or three weeks ago, I was talking to a, a, uh, a newcomer and I was as I was talking to her, I realized that she's a, a non-Christian, so I had a conversation with her. And then at the end of the service, uh, I, I saw her again, and then uh, as, as she was going down the escalator, escalator, something prompted me, hey, run after her. Run after her to share the gospel. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't usually do this. So run after her. So I, I just prompted, run after her. So I ran after her, went down the escalator, uh, and began to share the gospel. That's what, what I was prompted to do, share the gospel. And I was surprised that she was so ready uh, to receive the gospel. So I led her in a sinner's prayer, and her friends who were with her were tearing away. Uh, and, 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 and you capture uh, the Kairos moment, the, the divine moment that God wants you to do as you obey the voice. You don't know whether it's, it's accurate or not, but as you obey and walk by the Spirit, you begin to see how God can use you in your daily circumstances. Okay, so that is what it means to walk by the Spirit. You hear, you're not very sure, but you obey uh, and you do it and allow God to see how He can use you in extraordinary ways in your daily lives. Okay, and, and this walking by the Spirit uh, has another aspect. Has another aspect. In this passage, it talks about two things, the flesh and the Spirit. They are in opposition with each other. The sinful desires of the flesh are always in opposition with the Holy Spirit. So for example, there are temptations that come upon our life. There are temptations that come upon our life. Okay, our, our flesh is, is, is weak. Okay, our flesh is weak. Uh, they are opposite direction. But we like to quote one passage. We like to quote one verse. It's the most wrongly quoted verse that I always hear is this verse, okay? Matthew 26, verse 41. Next slide. Okay, this verse, ah, uh, Jesus say, uh, uh, they quote, uh, they quote. Ayah, the spirit is willing, uh, but the flesh is weak. Uh. I want to go cell group, but the spirit is willing, very willing. You check my heart, very willing. But the flesh is weak, leh. Next week, uh. I want to go church, but you know, uh, the spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. Let me sleep longer. Uh, uh, I want to do my quiet time every morning. Uh, yeah, but spirit is willing. Uh. You can check my heart. I open that, you see. But the flesh is weak. Leh. So, so God, sorry, sorry, sorry. You know, please excuse me. Okay, so this is, this is the most uh, quoted verse to justify uh, that. Uh, yeah, 
seems like the flesh more powerful. Eh? So excuse me, God. You understand, right? It's from the Bible. Huh? Bible, Bible verse, right? Yeah, so please excuse me. Huh? But they forget about the other verse. They forget in Romans 8.11 that the spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living who? Is living who? In you leh. They forgot to quote this one eh? How can they quote this one? The spirit that raised Christ, the body of Christ, the flesh from death to life, is in you leh. So who is more powerful, spirit or flesh? Spirit lah. They forgot to quote this one. Okay, so if the spirit of God is in you, it means that every temptation that you face, uh, the word of God says is, 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 not, uh, is, is not more powerful than your ability to resist. Every temptation that is in you, actually inside you, you already have the ability by the Spirit to say no. Wow, magic trick. Very good, right? Very good. Cover back, cover back. All, all inside, not good. Okay, he already has the ability to overcome the sin by the Spirit because that's the dunamis that's in him. Uh, but the problem is, a lot of times, it seems uh, like the flesh uh, is stronger. And there are some sins in our life uh, we cannot overcome. Okay, there are some sins. We try for the last five, ten years already. Still, it's still bothering us. We are enslaved. Addiction. Uh, we are enslaved by different things. The reason is because of this. Uh, the reason. Uh, turn the side. The reason is this. Um, because we have been feeding the flesh so much, right? The flesh now, right? is stronger than the spirit, okay? Because we feed this so much, now it becomes, it feels like it's stronger. It's like this, uh, I, I put my finger, just one finger on his forehead and Simon used all his strength to stand up. Try, 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 try harder, harder. Don't pretend, uh. just one finger, cannot. Try, don't bluff it, really, uh, try. You cannot, really, sure, one finger, you know. Okay, cannot, why? Because, because he's been feeding the flesh so much, it seems that he cannot overcome. He's in bondage. Okay, he's in bondage right now. He's a slave to sin. And the only way to overcome me, what's the solution? The only way is not brute strength. He cannot overcome by brute strength. Because now, I'm over him. The only way to conquer it is that you have to stop feeding the flesh. Okay, if you stop feeding the flesh, the flesh will become weaker. Okay, weaker and weaker. And lose his power so that one day Simon is able to stand. Okay, so it's about feeding. What do you feed in your daily life? What are the sins, addictions, uh, and, and desires of flesh that you're feeding on a daily life? So in our young adult ministry, uh, we have a lot of young adults who are enslaved by pornography, sexual addiction. Uh, so I have one case uh, that, that the, this person uh, sexual addiction leads to uh, even more serious things in his life. Uh, so I, I, he came in, in, in March. Uh, so we sat him down and we teach him about this principle of feeding. Uh, and in six months, from three to four times of pornography and masturbation every week, uh, six months later, he's doing it once a month. Okay, he's doing it once a month because he had learned not to feed it. And very soon, he'll be able to overcome uh, this bondage and this addiction uh, that's gripping his life and that's destroying uh, the relationships around him. Okay, so there's a power uh, in the Spirit of God in us, but we need accountability. We need people around us to help us to journey out of our bondage and addiction. So if you need help, uh, do approach another Christian, another brother to share so that together we can form the accountability. Together we can walk out of the addiction that uh, is binding us. You can approach rich counselling, you can approach the pastors for help because there's no shame uh, in accountability, there's no shame in helping each other to come out of sin. Uh, just now I ask you, is anger a sin? Correct? I have seen Christian families destroyed because of anger issues, okay? Anger issues in Christian family that's not dealt with affects everyone, okay? It may seem very minor, but there's a deeper root uh, in anger than 
we think. So how do we know anger is a sin? Is it my opinion? It's not my opinion because in the next chapter, we see that. Okay, we see that. Uh, point four. You are set free as evidenced by the law and the fruit of the Spirit. So it says here very clearly, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Paul is quoting from the law to help us understand what God likes and what God doesn't like. Okay, uh, Paul is helping us to understand what are the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, wild parties, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, hatred is the work of the flesh, discord, disunity, jealousy is the work of the flesh, fits of rage, okay, temper issues, selfish ambition, wow, I didn't know that that's, that's uh, work of the flesh. Climbing up the career ladder for yourself is the work of the flesh. Dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The law is not evil. The law tells us or help us as an audit to tell us whether we are living according to the flesh or according to the Spirit. It checks us uh, whether we are obeying uh, the Spirit or we are obeying the flesh. And next, Paul began to tell us, do you know what is of the Spirit? What is of the Spirit? Let me highlight to you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So from this, we see that the law is not something evil, it's to be avoided, and, and we just focus on the New Testament. But the law is basically something like this. For example, something grey. You don't know whether it is, um, it is right or is wrong. When you look at the Word of God, when you study the Word of God, you begin to have a clearer understanding what God loves and what God hates. So it's like this grey cloth, when you put through uh, the Bible, it comes out what? Black. Not magic trick, uh, I'm, I'm not David Copperfield. Black. Okay? So as a believer, if Simon knows, okay, this is black, I have to do something about it. I don't like it. I don't like to tell people I have this problem. But because it's black and it's been with me uh, for the past five years, uh, it's going from bad to worse. Okay? What must you do? Ah, must do something lah. Cannot stick for five years, still don't do, right? Then you got one black spot there. And then, if through the word of God, you realize what is white, love, joy, peace, patience, and it's becoming more and more a part of your life after you become a Christian, what do you do? You keep it. You grow in it. So that over time, if you realize that your life is getting more and more the fruit of the Spirit, then you know that you're walking according to the Spirit. But if over time, you realize that your life is getting more and more dark, okay, you really need to seek God and ask, hey God, am I obeying the voice of the flesh or am I obeying the voice of the Spirit? Thank you, Simon. Let's, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Simon. Something small. Thank you. So from this illustration, uh, we begin to understand. We begin to understand what are the things uh, through the law. We begin to understand what are the things that God likes and what are the things that God doesn't like. So let's look at the, the summary table once again. Uh, the, the, the two enemies of the gospel. One is legalism. One is hyper grace. But what is the gospel? The gospel means that we believe 100% the law of God, the Old Testament, we embrace it because through the law, we realize what God hates, what God likes. Through the, the, the law, we realize the holiness of God and we cannot match up. And through the law, we begin to realize, hey, I need the gospel of grace. I cannot meet it on my own. I need the finished work of Jesus Christ as my stabilizing factor uh, that is unchangeable in the storms of life. I sit on the gospel of grace and then from there, you live your Christian life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that is the gospel. We don't discard grace. We don't discard law. 
Both are important, 100% law, 100% grace, and that's how you live your Christian life, and that is the gospel. We are safe, therefore we obey. Lastly, my last point. Uh, as, as, as Paul ends this chapter, he reminds us that we are set free by what Christ has given. By what Christ has given. When you look at the work of the flesh and the work of the Spirit, uh, many of us sitting here will say, hey, pastor, sounds good, but most of the time I obey the works of the flesh. I let my flesh decide. Uh, and, and, and it's very hard for me to walk according to the Spirit. How do I do that? How do I do that? Realistically, how do I do that? Uh, Paul ends uh, with this portion to tell us that we can only do that if we begin uh, to gaze upon Jesus. He is the one who in the Garden of Gethsemane crucified his own flesh. When he, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, his flesh told him, Pray to God, let this cup pass from me because it is suffering. That was what his flesh was crying out uh, to Jesus to do. Uh, but the Spirit was speaking to him as well. The Spirit told him to pray this, My Father, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus obeyed the Spirit and he crucified his own flesh on our behalf. And because we belong to Jesus, uh, Paul is ex exhorting us, hey, crucify your own flesh just as Jesus has crucified his own flesh so that you'll be in Christ and you will follow Christ. Jesus is a different kind of master. He is a master that is good. The masters of the world enslave. But this master, Jesus Christ, is a good master who laid down his life for us. This is the master that gives us true liberty to live out who we are. And that uh, is proven by his life for us. He is the master that helps us to love God, love people and live within the limits of God's law so that we experience a full and abundant life. So God, uh, Jesus gave his life. The second thing that Jesus gave for us to live the Christian life is that he gave us the Holy Spirit. It is not enough just the gospel. He gave us the Holy Spirit to teach us how to listen and walk according to the Spirit. The Spirit of God is powerful. It's beyond imagination. Uh, just, just this year, um, uh, during the, the Grace Retreat, uh, my oldest daughter, Sec 2, oldest daughter, was sharing with me that at the beginning of this year, uh, she was facing a crisis of faith at Sec 2. She was questioning the existence of God. Uh, as a father, I raised her in a Christian home. Uh, read the Bible almost every day. And for her to have a crisis of faith and, and to, to doubt the existence of God uh, is a shock to me because she didn't tell us. Uh, and in June this year, when she went for uh, the Grace Retreat uh, at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the worship at the youth ministry site, the Holy Spirit came upon her. Uh, she started weeping. She started speaking in tongues and, and she experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. Nobody was praying for her. And she came back a different person, came back hungry uh, for God. So I realized, as a father, there's only so much I can do. There's some things I cannot do. And that's why the Holy Spirit was given. God can do what I cannot do. So I need God. I need God. I need the Holy Spirit because He's beyond the efforts of man. And I need to depend on Him and I cry out to Him. So God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. And we need the Holy Spirit like never before. The third thing God has given to us is His church. We cannot live a victorious Christian life as a lone ranger. We cannot live a victorious Christian life envying one another, uh, uh, competing with one another. We can only live the Christian life of accountability uh, in our community, in our cell groups, where God has placed us.